The explosion of Starship during Flight 7 remains an unforgettable spectacle, not only for space enthusiasts like us, but also in the minds of people across the world. However, the specific cause of the failure has yet to be fully disclosed. While Elon stated that the reason was an oxygen fuel link in the cavity above the ship engine firewall, what we really need is just a more detailed analysis. When did Starship begin leaking fuel, and from which component? Why did a spacecraft designed to carry humans and cargo to the Moon and Mars explode so easily? On today's episode of Alpha Tech, we'll dive deeper into these critical questions. But first, we need your support. Our next goal is 120,000 subscribers. Let's hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of our episodes. Of course, we'll strive to get better in every way. Thank you so much. The Starship explosion happened shockingly fast. While everyone was celebrating the success of Mechazoa catching the Super Heavy booster, the sudden loss of a signal from Starship was an abrupt and stunning disappointment. The first sign of a major onboard failure appeared at T plus 8 minutes and 26 seconds when Starship's telemetry suddenly ceased. Shortly thereafter, SpaceX and Elon confirmed a fire broke out in the engine bay, severely impacting performance. Based on preliminary assessments and past design vulnerabilities, the most likely cause of the fire was a methane fuel link from one of the engine transfer tubes known as E1. Huge thanks to the space engineer for giving amazing visuals and insightful analysis, allowing us to take a deeper look into the issue. Make sure you follow Space Engineer's X page and support him and the team. The transfer tubes mentioned above, which route propellant to the Raptor engines, have been identified as a structural weak point in previous tests. These components are subjected to extreme mechanical and thermal stress, making them prone to fractures or leaks, especially under dynamic flight conditions. In earlier ground and flight tests, similar issues had led to propellant leaks and localized fires, though none had resulted in total vehicle loss until this incident. Once the methane leak began, the highly flammable fuel likely accumulated within the engine cavity, creating a hazardous environment where ignition was almost inevitable. Given the intense heat generated by the nearby engines, any minor structural failure in the fuel line could have escalated into a full-scale fire, progressively damaging critical components and ultimately leading to power loss. The sequence of events set the stage for the catastrophic failure that followed. As the propellant seeped from the E1 transfer tube, it accumulated inside the engine cavity, creating a hazardous environment. The first signs of engine distress appeared when one of the Raptors shut down unexpectedly at T plus 739. This was likely caused by cavitation bubbles forming in the fuel lines, disrupting the engine's combustion stability. The presence of gas pockets instead of a steady liquid flow would have led to uneven thrust, triggering an automatic shutdown to prevent further damage. By this point, though the fire had already ignited, the situation got worse. Flames spread through the engine bay, damaging key components and compromising the vehicle's ability to continue controlled flight. As more systems failed, structural integrity weakened, accelerating the onset of total loss. Ground-based observers noticed flickering flames and change in flare color, indicating combustion of different materials as the fire consumed insulation, wiring, and structural elements. These visual cues confirmed that the damage was worsening in real time, with the expanding fire ultimately leading to Starship's catastrophic failure. As the fire spread through the engine bay, it damaged critical engine controllers, leading to multiple shutdowns in rapid succession. With several Raptors failing, Starship's thrust became unbalanced, reducing its ability to maintain stable flight. At T plus 8 minutes and 26 seconds, the situation reached a critical point where the battery failed, cutting off electrical power to the whole vehicle. This power loss disabled avionics, telemetry, and any remaining engine controls, marking the moment of loss of signal. Without any stabilization, Starship began tumbling uncontrollably, unable to correct its trajectory. Ground observers noted venting from the aft section, likely caused by residual propellant escaping from damaged plumbing and pressure relief tubes. With no active control or thrust, the vehicle was in an uncontrolled coast phase, rapidly approaching structural breakup. Following the loss of signal, Starship remained intact for nearly three minutes despite its uncontrolled tumbling. Unlike a sudden explosion, the vehicle gradually broke apart due to aerodynamic and structural stress, eventually reaching a critical failure point. At T plus 11 minutes and 22 seconds, as Starship neared the boundary of the designated flight corridor, the Flight Termination System, or FTS, activated, ensuring the vehicle didn't stray beyond safe limits. The breakup occurred between two designated airspace hazard zones, confirming that the termination was executed in a controlled manner. Telemetry and tracking data indicate the vehicle disintegrated at an altitude of approximately 75 to 76 kilometers, which is lower than expected. 
This suggests that structural weakening combined with an uncontrolled descent may have contributed to an earlier than planned breakup. As Starship re-entered the atmosphere, it broke into two main fragments, with the nose cone and engine section separating mid-re-entry. The engine section burned up rapidly due to extreme aerodynamic heating while the nose cone survived longer, likely due to its thermal protection system TPS, and reinforced structure. Post-flight analysis identified thermal protection tiles and engine components among the recovered debris. Some debris was detected by seismometers in the Caribbean, suggesting high-entry impact events as fragments reached the ocean. Following the loss of Starship, the FAA activated its air disaster response plan, initiating a formal investigation into the failure. SpaceX initially stated that all debris remained within the designated hazard zone, but later revised its statement as reports emerged of debris recovery across the Caribbean. There were some claims of property damage and possible human injury, prompting further scrutiny of SpaceX's containment protocols. Investigators are now examining both design and operational failures, focusing on structural weaknesses, fuel system vulnerabilities, and engine bay fire risks. The findings of this investigation will likely influence future Starship flight approvals and safety regulations. To be honest, this loss is a setback for Starship, as the mission was intended to test several new systems, including the first-ever flight of Starship Block 2. However, SpaceX has a strong track record of quickly addressing issues and returning to flight, demonstrating its resilience in overcoming challenges. To prevent similar issues in the future, engineers are exploring solutions such as improving the vehicle's ventilation system or, as Elon suggested, integrating a fire suppression system into Starship similar to those used on booster rockets. Implementing such a system would require hardware modifications as well as updates to the ship's quick disconnect system and launch tower to accommodate CO2 suppression inside the vehicle. While Ship 33 was lost, SpaceX successfully installed another booster, which is now undergoing inspection and potential refurbishment at Mega Bay 1 for a future flight. With Ship 33's failure, attention's now shifted to Ship 34, which completed cryoproof testing at Massey just two days after Flight 7. Since then, the vehicles returned to Mega Bay 2 for the installation of aft flaps, engines, and other modifications before moving on to static fire tests at Massey. Meanwhile, its counterpart, Booster 15, is currently in Mega Bay 1, with grid fin installation underway. It's expected to undergo static fire testing within the next one to two weeks. Since Ship 33 did not achieve its primary mission objectives, SpaceX will likely conduct another suborbital test flight to further evaluate the Block 2 Starship. Had Ship 33 successfully completed all test objectives, Ship 34 could have been the first to attempt an orbital flight and demonstrate reusability. The launch date for Flight 8 remains uncertain as it depends on both vehicle readiness and regulatory approval. Recently, SpaceX applied to the FCC for a Starship test flight communications license starting February 24th of this year, meaning that Flight 8 cannot launch any earlier than that date. This timeline aligns with SpaceX's goal of completing 25 Starship flights this year. Ship 34 could be ready by later this month, while Booster 15, following the schedule of its predecessor, 14, may not be ready to go until April, although SpaceX might be able to accelerate that. However, regulatory hurdles may pose a greater challenge than hardware readiness. Unlike the previous three Starship flights, this failure has led to more complex legal complications due to the ongoing FAA investigation. SpaceX cannot launch until the investigation is complete or unless it gets a safety waiver. Since debris fell outside the designated area and disrupted air traffic, obtaining such a waiver could be difficult. As a result, FAA approval for the next launch might not happen until the investigation is formally concluded. After all, let's hope the FAA's investigation does not drag on too long, as Starship is an incredibly important spacecraft, not just for SpaceX, but for the U.S. as a whole. Moving on to SpaceX news out of Florida, recently SpaceX successfully launched the Worldview Legion satellites for Maxar Intelligence. On a foggy Tuesday evening, SpaceX successfully launched two Worldview Legion sats on behalf of Maxar, a division of Maxar Technologies. These sats were placed in mid-inclination Earth orbit, or MEO for short, following their separation from Falcon 9. The mission, dubbed Maxar 3, lifted off from LC-39A at Kennedy Space Center, marking SpaceX's second Falcon 9 launch that day. For this mission, SpaceX used the Falcon 9 first stage booster, B-1086, which was making its fourth flight. This booster has previously served as a side booster on the Goes U Falcon Heavy mission before being repurposed for two Starlink launches as a standard Falcon 9 booster. Demonstrating SpaceX's advanced reusability capabilities, booster B-1086 successfully came back to Earth in under eight minutes, touching down at LZ-1 at Cape Canaveral. The milestone marked the 48th successful booster landing at LZ-1 and the 405th booster landing in SpaceX's overall history. 
The deployment process for the Worldview Legion sets was executed in multiple phases. First deployment, the first satellite, was released following the second burn of the Falcon 9 upper stage approximately 47 minutes into the launch. Additional burns. The Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage did two more burns to fine-tune the orbital parameters before releasing the second satellite. Final deployment. The second satellite was successfully deployed about an hour and 50 minutes into the mission, completing the launch sequence. Worldview Legion satellites and their role in Earth imaging were manufactured by Maxar Systems, another division of Maxar Technologies. These sets were shipped from Maxar's Palo Alto, California location and got to Florida early last month to undergo final integration and processing prior to launch. These new deployed spacecraft complete the first block of Worldview Legion satellites, expanding Maxar's 30-centimeter class satellite imagery capabilities. Prior to launch, the company already operated four Worldview Legion satellites in MEO and maintained six other ones in sun-synchronous orbit. With this addition, Maxar continues to strengthen its leadership in high-res Earth observation, giving unparalleled quality and precision. The company announced that its enhanced imaging fleet will now be capable of capturing up to 3.5 million kilometers of high-res imagery a day, a capability unmatched before by any other commercial provider. Maxar offers its vast satellite imagery library through two main platforms. The Maxar Geospatial Platform Pro, which allows users to access and purchase individual higher-res images tailored to specific needs, and then Vivid Advanced Base Map, which gives a seamless, continuous, updated view of the Earth, catering to clients who require comprehensive and regularly refreshed geospatial data. As the demand for high-precision geospatial intelligence grows, Maxar's expanded satellite constellation will play a crucial role in global monitoring, mapping, disaster response, and defense applications. With SpaceX's continued success in reusable rockets and Maxar's advancements in satellite imaging, the launch of these latest Worldview Legion satellites represent another major step forward in Earth observation capabilities. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.